It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for the great invitation here. It's wonderful to be in such nice warm weather. It's so <laughs> warm here in the winter. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, so um, our lab works in uh, mobile health. It's an area, this is an area that uh, spans uh, the behavioral sciences. Uh, help, helping people change their behaviors, maintain behavior change. It also spans uh, computer science because it involves the area of what's called reinforcement learning. If you're familiar with machine learning, there's three areas in reinforcement learning. It's one of these areas, and this has to do with sequential decision making. Um, and then, of course, it involves uh, statistics as well. And we're, we work with a number of uh, company, P, uh, investigators across different settings, um, companies to improve engagement with their mobile apps. Uh, this is a company that sells this app to other companies to help their employees. Um, with Kaiser, uh, this is a, a study uh, in mobile health about helping people manage their health and eating after they've had bariatric uh, surgery. The goal is to prevent the after, after state. Um, we also work in substance use. Uh, and um, as I was speaking to one of the audience members uh, in smoking cessation, today we're going to focus our, uh, the whole, our, to make the uh, talk uh, clear, I'll talk about heart steps. So you'll see me go through heart steps. I'll describe it in a good bit of detail. So um, Heart Steps is um, a project which involves three studies, one after the other. And it's the purpose of Heart Steps is to provide support for people who are at very high risk of an adverse cardiac event. And uh, if you're familiar with mobile health, I've already uh, failed to mention many of the studies that have to go on. So there's a lot of user studies that go on ahead of time. There's a lot of uh, user design, uh, qualitative studies. I won't mention these here. Uh, I'll s focus my attention on the first of the data studies, and that's this 42-day micro-randomized study. Uh, the second study, the three-month study, it goes into the field at the end of uh, this month. And we'll, uh, I'll, I'll explain to you what micro-randomized means uh, as the talk goes on. So in these studies, um, uh, in, in heart steps, we have one wearable. It's, it's a, what, at that time, it was a jawbone wristband. Uh, this gave us step counts at the minute level, uh, as well as some crude measure of sleep quality. Um, and we also used a lot of the sensors on the smartphone. And you see, uh, I listed some of the sensors we used the person's current location, what the weather was like. This was all about helping people be active, so we really wanted to know what the weather was like at that time in their, the location <coughs> they were in. Uh, we also uh, had a, 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 a classifier that ran off of their calendar to see how busy their calendar was over periods at different periods of time, because if you're really busy, you're much like, less likely to be active and so on. And then we had some evening self-report, and this is pretty common in most uh, mobile health studies. Of course, often we want to reduce the amount of self-report because it's highly burdensome. Okay, one of the big questions was, in which context uh, should the smartphone interrupt you and attempt to provide some support to you so that you could be more physically active? So notice my language, interrupts you and attempts to provide support. This is already a cue towards the concerns that we have in this area. So uh, what I want to go through is uh, the structure of these mobile health interventions. And this is important. Uh, understanding the different parts of the intervention is important because different areas of science inform each part. So uh, we're going to focus on interventions uh, in which the intervention reaches out to you. And so this involves what we call decision points. These are time, uh, regular, in our case, they're going to be regular intervals in time at which uh, treatment might be delivered. So uh, when we first started thinking about this project, we were thinking 
that the decision points would be every minute. And the reason why we, we wanted to do that is because the finer the time points are, the more it appears to be real time to the user. Just because you have decision points every minute doesn't mean you bother them every minute. It just means that at any given minute, you could provide support. Uh, now, at the end, we, uh, we were, had access to a, a good bit of jawbone data, and we found that uh, among the participants we were interested in, these were people who had regular jobs, uh, daytime jobs. If you looked at the within-person uh, variance in activity level, it peaked, that variance peaked around five times a day related to their job. And I list these five times right before the morning commute, midday, mid-afternoon, around the evening commute, and after dinner. So that within person variance, that, that signals that that's a time that you might be able to help the person increase their step count. And so we went to these five times per day. Of course, the five times differ from one person to another, depending on whether they had a later start in the day or early start in the day. But the decision time points here are at these five times. Uh, in other studies, they could be every minute um, or even more frequent. So at each decision point, we have observations. That, and the observations accrue between the decision points. And there, there's two types of observations. Uh, observation that just comes in through the phone or the wearable. So sensor data, these, this could be collected at very fine intervals in time, but we accrue that data to the next decision point. And then you have actively collected data. This is where we ask you questions, you the user, and then we use the data. And in the case of hard steps, that was only at the daily level, once per day. So data is coming in at multiple scales of time, and we keep track of that data, and we, we use it up to that decision point. Then we go to the next decision point. We see how much more data we have, and we accrue that. And I list here some of the types of data that uh, come. We had a variety of classifiers running on the phone. By that, I mean every minute we knew uh, whether or not you might be going so fast that you might be operating a vehicle. This is important in these, this setting, uh, whether or not you were walking and so on. And then uh, other uh, measures as well. So OK. We've listed two parts of an, a mobile health intervention that involves the intervention reaching out to you to attempt to provide support. The, this is the part where we talk about the reaching out to you to provide support, and these are the intervention options. So these are types of treatments that can be provided. It turns out um, if you're not uh, familiar with mobile health, and certainly I wasn't when I ver uh, first started in this area, you think to yourself, well, there's really not much you can do. But it turns out there's a whole variety of interventions that can be de provided via a mobile device. Many of these interventions are behavioral. There are ideas for what you might do. We're going to have an example of that here. Others are cognitive. For example, if you're trying to quit smoking, how do you reframe a lapse to smoking so that you can try again. Um, other interventions are social, have a social component where it uh, reaches out to others so that they help you. And um, then there's interventions that are motivational. So a whole variety of types of interventions that can be provided. Not only that, there's engagement strategies. How can we keep you engaged enough so that when we reach out to you, you pay attention to the device and what the message says. So there's a variety of engagement strategies to keep the user engaged so they don't, well, delete the app or ignore the notifications. And of course, then whether or not we even bother you at a particular decision point is important, whether to provide a treatment. So for this simplified version, I'm gonna, uh, we'll get to a, a, the more the accurate version of heart steps. I'm going to focus on one type of intervention that we uh, interrupted the individual to provide, and that was these tailored activity suggestions. Why do I say they're tailored? They're tailored to the sensor data we have on you at that time. So the content of the message, if it's provided, is tailored to your location, 
uh, whether you're at home, work, or elsewhere. Uh, it's tailored to the weather outside. Uh, it's tailored to uh, the time of the day, morning, afternoon, and so on, and weekend versus weekday. So the content of the, we're in, we wanted the, the uh, a suggestion to be really actionable in your life at that time, and that's why the content is tailored this way. And here you see an example. So this arrived, uh, it was pretty cold that day, uh, not like here, this is uh, Michigan cold, so cold. Uh, but it wasn't too bad in that world. Uh, so it says, hey, look outside, not too bad, this is a work day. Maybe you could walk to work today or just park a bit further away. And this appears on the phone. So it was intended to help you be active at that moment. Uh, and then you, the user, could make this notification go away by pressing uh, thumbs down. You, you didn't find it really useful thumbs up, you thought it was useful, or you could press the middle button. If you press the middle button, a drop-down menu, come, uh, you see a drop-down menu, and you can turn off these notifications entirely for, for 8 or 12 hours. So you, the user, you have control. You know, you don't have to be interrupted if you don't want to be. So here, we're going to focus on whether or not, in, in the data analysis, uh, the first set I'll show you, we're focusing on whether or not to even provide a notification. Why do we do that? Because we're so concerned that if we interrupt you too much, you'll start to ignore these notifications. It, they won't be useful for you anymore, or you'll delete the app. So the, if you're thinking like a statistician, this is where the signal-to-noise ratio is, the, is likely to be the highest whether to provide or not. And that's because of the negative consequences of providing too much. It's also a reason why you're interested in experimentation. If there was no negative consequences of notifying someone, there'd be no reason to learn whether or not it was useful. We just provide it all the time, right? There'd be no negative consequences. But there's negative consequences here of t providing or uh, interrupting the person too much. Uh, one thing to realize in this setting, and uh, originally when I got into mobile health, I thought this wouldn't be an issue. I, I really wanted to avoid it. Um, it causes a, a, you have to be really careful with causal inference in this setting. I'll speak about that further uh, later. Um, and that is, there are certain contexts, that is certain settings, in which it is inappropriate to, to uh, send a notification to the user. Uh, and this is called availab unavailability. So they're available when you can send a notification, you might send one, and uh, they're not available or unavailable when you should not send one. So in the case of heart steps, if the sensors on the phone indicate that they might be driving a vehicle, it is inappropriate for the phone to light up audibly ping an attempt to deliver an activity message because we might uh, distract the, the driver. If they're currently walking, it was also scientifically inappropriate to interrupt the individual. Why? Because the type of intervention or type of treatment we wanted to provide was a suggestion for a new activity. You don't want to bother someone if they're already walking to tell, suggest they try a different walking activity, right? So again, uh, users are unavailable. Participants are unavailable if, they, if they're walking. Uh, also, of course, if they've turned off the intervention, they're unavailable. So uh, I'm going to now, if you, were, if, you worked in, if you work in reinforcement learning or in sequential decision making in computer science, this is a setting where the, treat, the set of treatments or actions is constrained by the current state, the context. And that's what we're talking about right now. So if you're unavailable, we don't bother you. So how do we decide whether or not it's worthwhile to provide a suggestion to you at one of these five times a day? Remember, we have five times uh, associated with your work schedule. And this is based on this notion of a proximal outcome an outcome that's proximal in time. I just want to, uh, up to now, we've been indexing everything by uh, t. You see how availability is indexed by little t. That's the decision time, five times a day. 
Uh, but I indexed uh, the outcome by t plus 1. And this is just the mnemonic to me to remember the outcome always occurs after you might provide an intervention. And in this case, it's the step count over the 30 minutes following uh, one of those, each of those five times per day. Okay. Um, so this uh, is a little bit more about this near-time outcome. The way these, in this particular case, these tailored activity suggestions, they were developed to be near-time actionable. Why? So then why did we choose 30 minutes instead of an hour or two hours or 15 minutes? You have, uh, when you're thinking about the time interval over which you want an outcome, if you wait too long, they may have left the context they were in at that moment. So the content of the treatment is no longer actionable. If you wait too short of a time, say like five minutes, they, don't have had they won't have had time to act on the suggestion. So there's a fine balancing uh, between how long you should wait uh, to assess whether or not this suggestion had an impact on the, out, the step count in the subsequent time. Uh, here we chose 30 minutes. And the big issues when we were designing these studies, the, the, the first uh, concerns we had was, is there any signal here at all? Does providing a suggestion at one of these times really impact these people? Uh, and uh, because of the burden issues, does this effect deteriorate with time? Because you might think it would deteriorate with time because people habituate to these messages. They don't see them anymore. They just stop paying attention. So when we designed the study, um, we designed it with, to make sure we, we uh, ensured that we had enough participants so we could address these questions. That was the primary way in which we decided the number of participants. Of course, we're very interested in other aspects of context. Does it affect the uh, usefulness of these messages? Could be that if I'm at home, they're more effective than, if I, than am I when I'm at work, and so on. Um, how, how can we think about this treatment effect? Uh, that is, whether or not we provide a message at a particular time on your subsequent 30-minute step count. Here I have a little schematic. It's extremely crude. Uh, it's very crude. This is a 42-day study, five times a day. Five times 42 is 210. That's why the horizontal axis has 210 decision points here. It's because there's 210 times at which we might, may or may not, provide an uh, activity <coughs> suggestion. So how might we think of the effect of that activity suggestion? So the effect is, did we provide the suggestion versus did we not on your subsequent step count? Well, when we were thinking about this study, I drew this little picture and we, in order for us to think more carefully. So at the beginning, I thought, well, people at the beginning, they're new to this intervention. They're going to be too confused. It probably won't have any impact whether or not we send an intervention or not. So the effect is essentially zero. This is what I was thinking. Uh, and then as time goes on, man, they really like the intervention. They try it out. If they get a message, they act on it. If they don't get a message, they just continue in their own standard way of living, right? So I might expect that the effect of the intervention on step count versus no intervention would increase with time. And then I thought, well, now after a while, people will start to habituate, they'll get tired, and the effect will deteriorate. They just won't even see the message or they'll ignore it. This is what I was thinking. So just as I have a treatment that varies across time, 210 times, at which you could, you may or may not get a treatment, you might think of an effect that varies over time. And indeed, by the end of the study, you might not have an effect at all. Now there's another reason why this effect may change with time. And this, is really, this also uh, means one has to be uh, very uh, careful and thoughtful when you, you do data analytics or data science. At the beginning of the study, almost everybody is available. Almost there, unless they're driving. I'll just ignore the driving. I'll say that just happens by happenstance. But pretty much everyone is available in general. 
as the study goes on, some people get really engaged. And they're already walking at those decision points. They're not available anymore. The only people left as the study progresses are the people who are still sedentary around those time points. Indeed, it could be the most treatment resistant people are still there. So like if by the close to the end of the study, it could be that most of the people that are still, that might get an intervention are the most treatment resistant because the people who really like the intervention are already, they've already incorporated this activity, some sort of activity into their daily life. So you, you'd get a decrease in effect because the people among whom you're assessing the effect are more and more treatment resistant. See that? So there's two reasons why we might expect the effect to change with time. One, in general, people get bored, they start to ignore it. Two, there's some subset of people who really engage, and the ones that are not really engaging, they were never, it doesn't work for them anyway, and that's all, I'm seeing more and more of those kinds of people as the study progresses. Very interesting. Uh, okay, so what we conducted uh, in this 42-day study uh, was a micro-randomized trial. And indeed, all of the little schematics I showed you on that first slide, these were all micro-randomized trials. So we call them micro-randomized. This is because at every one of those 210 times, the individual is randomized. Uh, if you're in computer science, I'm not. <laughs> I just want to tell you, if you're in computer science, this means we're using a stochastic policy. Uh, so to collect the data, to choose whether or not to provide treatment. Uh, so here um, we have uh, five times a day, uh, 42 days, that's 210 randomizations. Now, of course, some of the time people won't be available, so any given person might not, they won't be randomized all 210 times, because if they're not available, they won't be randomized, right? Uh, and we, uh, at first, we, when we were designing this study, we thought, well, we would like to provide the intervention around two of the five times per day, which would lead you to a probability of two-fifths, 0.4 for the treatment. But then, as is common in these mobile health studies, you always run about five to 10 participants before you start a real study. One of the reasons you do this is because the software code is totally buggy, but that's a different. But also, you, you see how frequent people are available due to the driving. It turns out around 20% of the time, 20% of those decision points, people were not available due to driving. So we changed the randomization to uh, uh, point 0.6, that is three out of the five times you would get randomized to treatment because we essentially lost one of the five times to driving every day on average. So on average, due to people driving, they'd get around two times a day. But if they, were never, if they never drove, they'd get around three times a day. Everybody with me? So in general, the randomization probability here, uh, in these settings, at least so far in our work, it's determined by considerations of burden in the sense that we decided ahead of time, look, on average, we wanted around two interventions per day. We were worried if we provided many more than that, people would start to disengage. So burden forced that constraint on this randomization, and then also availability. Um, In other, I'm just going to get off the track. Uh, I'm just doing this for the machine learning people who like algorithms. So in other studies, uh, an alg we, we build an algorithm that determines this randomization probability. And it's an algorithm that, ha that does a constrained optimization problem. The constraints are due to burden. And the optimization is spreading out the interventions across the whole day. You don't want to be in a setting where you mainly intervene in the morning. You want to intervene across the day. And so we'll have an algorithm that helps us spread out the treatments. Whatever budget we have, 
we want to spread them out across the day. So it's very interesting. Uh, but here it was, it was quite simple. Uh, with probability 0.6, we provide an intervention. With probability 0.4, we don't at every single available decision time. Okay, I want to get to uh, how we, in this particular study, it's complete, uh, uh, in the computer science lingo, this is called complete exploration. Uh, so all of the data analyses that go on are after the study is over. And that's what we're going to talk about now. And I think it's quite interesting to, un to have a feeling for what kinds of results you would get from studies of this type. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a set of conceptual models. This is not, um, these are conceptual models. So that's why there's this little quote here. <laughs> it's, it's a way for us to think, but we're not fitting like a regression model. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, okay, so we always have our, pro at every, after every decision point, we have our proximal outcome, in our case, the 30-minute step count after the decision point. And then we have uh, a, a, a wide uh, variety of features from the sensor data. Uh, we have an indicator, A, of whether or not we provided, we uh, notified the person to provide an activity message. The A is 1 in that case. It's equal to 0 otherwise, and uh, so on. I want to go through this. So here's where you start mixing uh, statistics from clinical trials in with uh, this, uh, the conduct of a trial uh, in a mobile health. And so uh, in clinical trials, uh, the way we conduct them is we always, we're always very concerned about noise. Uh, clinical trials in, in, in the human, uh, with human subjects are, have extremely noisy data. It's it, critical to do your best to reduce the noise. And that's what the role of the blue part of the model is. It's noise reduction. It's to increase the signal to noise ratio so you can detect whether or not these suggestions are having any impact on these people at all. Uh, so, and how do we do that? Well, we, we often say we control. We control by a variety of variables. In our case, this is going to be sensor data uh, to reduce the noise uh, in our uh, outcome of uh, step count in the 30 minutes following a decision point. The most natural control variable is a measure right before that decision point. So in our case, in heart steps, uh, we used the step count in the 30 minutes prior to that decision point. So you, this is very common in uh, clinical trials that you use a pretreatment measure of the outcome to increase the signal to noise ratio. Here, pretreatment has this dynamic aspect, right? Because we have 210 times at which we might treat. So there's 210 pretreatment times, 210 after treatment times. Okay, but that's, this part of the model is not interesting scientifically. This is just a way to purify the signal. That's all it is. But science-wise, behavioral science is just not interesting at all. Uh, so the, it's just, that's just the reality of the setting. Uh, so here, though, now I've gotten to the science. And this is when you start to do a clinical, when you analyze data from a, a clinical trial, you have a set of pre-specified hypotheses. And I already mentioned the pre-specified hypotheses for this study. They were, do we have an effect at all? Does this message have an impact on these people at all in terms of their activity level? That's the number one. Number two, does this effect deteriorate with time? Because I was very worried about that. So this is what you see me doing here. So the first one is, um, the, it's a co coefficient of the indicator of treatment. This coefficient is the treatment effect. So uh, it represents an average effect, on average, what is the difference in step count if you get a, a message versus if you don't get a message? That's what it represents. And I tried to make this really clear in the text following that. It's the effect marginal over all observed and unobserved variables. Time of day, gender. 
whether or not how physically active the person was before they entered this study, uh, their age, whether or not it was a weekend or a weekday. This is just on average, if you get a message versus if you don't, what is the average effect of that message? Average across all kinds of things. It's still causal because we randomize people to get a message versus not. That is, they're balanced. The people who got a message are balanced with the people who didn't get a message. But it's marginal, gender, marginal over gender, and so on. Causal, yet marginal. Then we start to unpack it. This is very common because uh, you want to get closer and closer to personalization. And here I just gave you a highly simplistic uh, uh, one, where um, S is 1 if the weather is good and 0 otherwise. So now I just look at the combination of the two coefficients. The sum is the, say, let's just focus on 1 when the weather's good. So this combination of these, the value of these two uh, parameters is the effect of ha getting a message when the weather is good versus not getting a message. It's still marginal. It's still averaged over gender. It's still averaged over the day of the week. It's still averaged over how active the person was before they entered the study. No matter what, it's marginal. In fact, it's always going to be marginal over data that we don't collect in this study. So we didn't collect, for example, in this study, we didn't collect whether each day, whether or not your child threw a fit in the morning as you were getting them ready to go to school. It's marginal over that. Okay? That's an unobserved variable. We did collect gender, but it's not in the model, so it's marginal over that as well. That's an observed variable. And so on. Any aspect of context, location, current weather, it's marginal over all of that. But it's still causal because it's a randomized, a little randomized comparison. Okay. So when we, were tr uh, when we were thinking about how to run these studies and then how to do the data analytics for the studies afterwards, we wanted to uh, produce a, a method that would allow us to make these kinds of statements, the kinds of statements I made uh, to you on the prior slide. That is, we wanted to be able to assess the overall average effect of getting a message versus not, we wanted to assess the average effect when the weather's good versus when it's not, and so on and so forth. Marginal yet causal. There were two big challenges in this setting. If you're a statistician and you're, you work in causal inference, you're acutely aware of this. First of all, the treatment is varying with time. Second of all, your independent variables, that is the pretreatment measure of activity, is in fact could be an outcome of prior treatment. This is where all those directed acyclic graphs come in. Uh, the minute your variables could be out, uh, impacted by prior treatment, suppose you really like this treatment, then you might already have been a little active in the prior 30 minutes. Uh, in fact, you're not even available if you were really active in the prior 30 minutes. So in all of these cases, the variables we want to use to control or to help us increase the signal-to-noise ratio, they could have been impacted by prior treatment. So one has to be very careful how you uh, analyze this type of data. Are you, even though you had randomization, you will destroy the main um, beauty of randomization, that is our ability to assess the causal effect of whether or not providing a treatment increased uh, step count. So the processing of the data is critical here. One does not want the processing of the data to destroy your ability to answer these kinds of questions. Uh, we also wanted to uh, ha uh, construct a method which would allow us to uh, uh, conduct the noise reduction using the control variables but not uh, this, the number of controls that one might use, this could be a vast amount of features from the sensor data. There's no way we're going to be able to get some adequate model of step count.
that we can guarantee is correct. So the method we develop has to be robust to any kind of um, incorrect model that we might use to reduce noise. Those were the challenges. Uh, that's our job as a statistician. Our job is to deal with these challenges, so that's what we did. Um, so we, we invented this method called centered and weighted least squares. Uh, it's very interesting because it has nothing to do, even though I said least squares, um, we're not fitting regressions. It's just we were able to uh, uh, construct an approach which uh, allows uh, people to use a regression to answer these questions, although it, the uh, method itself is not a regression. Uh, so it, uh, what it does is it allows us to get unbiased inference for the causal uh, treatment effects. That was the big deal. We want to be able to answer these questions. It's important for the health sciences. Uh, and it allowed us to prevent bias by how we use the controls to reduce the noise. Um, so I'm going to use it now with the data from Heart Steps to show you some of the questions we can answer. Uh, here's a schematic of the Heart Steps trial. So uh, these trials actually are always a lot more complicated than I gave you to uh, at the beginning. So first of all, all of these interventions have many different components. Only a subset of the components do we want to learn about. So all of the intervention, all of the, like uh, in this particular intervention, um, mobile health intervention, there was a component that uh, I as a user could go to and track my physical activity over time. But we didn't experiment with this. I just want everyone to know uh, that, of course, had to be user tested and so on. What we experimented with were two components. One were these physical activity messages. And here, that's this top line. So I'm not sure if you can see there's the observations. I had uh, listed some of them in prior slides. And then what happens is at each of the five times you have your observations, your available observations, you check to see whether or not the person is currently driving. If not, you check to see if they're currently walking. We also check to see if they turned off the intervention. If, uh, if it makes it past all these checks, then you randomize them uh, on average three times a day to, uh, obtain, to receive a tailored intervention. or. Uh, or two times a day to not, on average, to not receive, not be bothered at all. Uh, and then we were interested in the proximal outcome, which I listed to you as well. There was another part of this study uh, that we also experimented with. Every evening, you were, uh, each person in the study was randomized. Notice the number of randomizations we're talking about here, right? The glory of experimentation. Uh, every evening you were randomized whether or not you would plan your next day's physical activity and how you would plan it. So with probability one half, you would be prompted to plan your next day's physical activity. With probability one half, we didn't bother you at all. This sounds overwhelming, right, all this randomization. Every time you go and open Google, or Amazon. This is what's going on with you. Except the goal is to sell you something. Okay? Here the goal is to help you. So let's, it's really important we realize this. We're going to use the same kinds of randomizations that go on every time you access the internet, <coughs> Facebook, and so on. But instead of trying to sell you something, we're going to do it to try and help you help yourself. Uh, if you're a statistician here, these are factorial designs. Think George Box. They're sequential factorial designs and multiple time scales. The bottom one is at the daily time scale. The other is within the day. Uh, we have other studies where at baseline we randomize you as well. Sequential within a person is totally cool. As a statistician, it just like turns you on. Anyway, uh, but this is what we did. <laughs> what can I say, man? Uh, uh, I wish I could have. If you can't, uh, I have this other talk I'm going to give later on in this uh, 
tour where uh, if you know uh, Cole Porter, I don't know if you guys know who Cole Porter is, he's some famous guy. Uh, anyway, uh, he has this great song called Experimentation and it's all about this. Totally uh, cool. I advise you to go to YouTube, uh, look at Experimentation Cole Porter, uh, beautiful song. It's all about randomized, randomized. Anyway, okay, so in this study we have 37 people. It turns out when you're doing this intensive randomization, you, don't, uh, you often don't need a lot of people. Uh, and the first randomization I'm going to focus on is whether or not to provide a suggestion. Uh, I think I'm going to run out of time. This may be the only one. When do I stop? I must stop pretty soon, huh? How long? Yeah, okay. So, I think I'll just talk to you about this one, uh, and then uh, we'll unpack it just a little bit, and we'll stop, and I can talk to you about other inter, uh, analyses we did. So first we wanted to know, is it worthwhile to provide a suggestion versus not? So we, here's our conceptual model. Uh, you, we transformed all our step counts by a log. This is very common in statistics because what, we, what we're doing is uh, step counts are highly skewed and a log helps us have good small sample properties of, uh, so that we give you good confidence intervals. That's, that's the whole reason why we transform it. We only used one control, oh, I'm using my dot here. Uh, we only used one control variable, and that was your pretreatment measure of uh, step count. It turned out, you know, even though you have massive amounts of data, once you include someone's pretreatment 30 minutes prior to the decision point step count, man, you have soaked up so much of the variance. It is unreal. It's amazing how in these very high dimensional problems, you can get so local to the treatment that you can use very simple analyses. It's just, it's quite striking. Uh, I was very, the second analysis we're going to look at is whether or not day in study, this is day in study, it's uh, coded as zero the first day up to 41 because there were 42 days in this study. And I was really concerned that this coefficient would be negative because uh, I expected the effect of the intervention to deteriorate with time because of burden. I was so concerned about that. So here's the first analysis. Uh, I have to look at my cheat sheet. Everything is on the log scale, so I just have to interpret this. So, um, so uh, I'm just showing you the, uh, the confidence interval here um, for the average effect you get a message versus if you don't. It's 0.13, but that's on the log scale. This is a 14% increase in step count over if you don't get um, uh, uh, a message. People in this study, they're very sedentary. Um, they got around an average of 250 steps in a 30-minute period, and this is uh, an increase of 33, around 33 steps. Unfortunately, um, for me anyway, uh, and for all of us, my conjecture was right, my concern. So here's that next analysis where we include an effect of the day. I mean, uh, we look, it's not an effect of the day, I'm sorry. It's whether or not the day, uh, including day, change, you get a deterioration in effect. And indeed, uh, we did. We get a negative coefficient here. Um, Unfor this is quite unfortunate. This means burdens increasing with time. So I want to interpret this a little bit for you. So remember, dt is zero on the first day of the study. So that's what the meaning of this uh, first term is the impact very early in the study. So 0.51, this is a 67% increase in your step count uh, if you get a message versus not. That's around 170 steps. So that's a big increase at the early in the study. Unfortunately, with this negative trend, uh, it's a 42-day study, by about day 21, the impact was gone, completely gone. Very interesting. So in the next round of heart steps, we, are, we have a lot of engagement strategies we're using. We're also using some algorithms to detect increasing burden and then the randomization probabilities go down when we detect increasing burden. 
Uh, we also had two types of messages. I just want to talk to you about this because this explain, uh, tells you how people can really mess these problems up. So uh, we had two types of messages. One was this tailored walking activity suggestion. This actually took some effort on your part. It took about three minutes or so to enact. Uh, the other was uh, uh, anti-sedentary message. Uh, uh, the anti-sedentary messages I loved. They made you feel really good. Um, an example of that was, um, why don't you stand up right now and roll your arms? Man, it feels good, right? You, you're physically active, you're rolling your arms. Right. Uh, so, uh, so here uh, we have two types of messages, point three, point three, and point four. And so we wanted to know, well, do, does one of these messages work um, differently from the other? It turns out, uh, so A, 1, T is 1. I just have to tell you what this means. It's 1 if you've got this more burdensome message, 0 otherwise. A, 2, if a subscript of 2 is 1 if you've got the engaging message, 0 otherwise. Only the coefficient of the burdensome message was, was uh, looked significant, had a nice confidence interval. Uh, this is about a 23% increase in your step count. Why did we mess this all up? Does anybody know why? That proximal outcome is the step count in the subsequent 30 minutes. Why in the world did we think giving a message, stand up and roll your arms, might increase your step count in the subsequent 30 minutes. So we, in the next study, we are have a totally different proximal outcome for the anti-sedentary message. It's very interesting, I think, anyway. Uh, we actually did have a deteriorating effect with time. Here's the summary. I, I'm not going to show you the analyses. Uh, the data indicates that there's a causal effect of the activity suggestion on the step count in the subsequent subsequent 30 minutes. So getting a message versus not, we actually get an effect. It appears though the effect is primarily due to a walking message. That is a message that is a little bit more burdensome. It takes like three minutes to enact. The effect deteriorates with time. Means the next study we got to really pay more attention to engagement. The walking activity suggestion, so this is what was really nice. This pap the paper associated with this uh, just got accepted. Uh, the walking activity suggestion initially increases the step count over the succeeding 30 minutes by about 271 steps. Remember, on average, they're getting 250 steps in a 30 minutes. So it just about doubles the amount of steps they got versus not. But by a halfway through the study, over. The effect is gone. By day 20, the increase is only 65, around 65. It's not even, the confidence interval includes zero, so you can't even say, you don't know, it might be zero. Um, these are the kinds of analyses you can do. Uh, in subsequent analyses, we also found that the location that you were at impacted your receptivity, whether or not you responded. Uh, if you were at home or work, you people were much more responsive, Where, whereas, if, you, if they were at the other location, which is a catch-all for, uh, like at the coffee shop, then the message doesn't seem to have any impact at all. We didn't uh, conjecture that ahead of time, so it wasn't part of the primary analyses. These analyses that you're seeing here were conjectured ahead of time, so we could report on them with greater validity in a scientific, uh, a domain science paper. I'm going to, the evening prompt, fascinating analyses here, but I'm just going to go through that because we don't have time. Uh, um, I just want to mention at the end, uh, in mobile health, before we started using uh, micro-randomization and experimentation, a lot of us used random effects models. It turns out this is a setting where the analyses we love to use random affixed models, or what they're often called multi-level models in the behavioral sciences. A lot of the machine learning generalizations, they weren't, uh, they weren't designed for this setting, and they actually mess up the causal inference. It's fascinating. So you have to do the, you have your, yeah. 
they actually eliminate the advantages of the randomization. Oh, uh, okay, so we have tons of other studies. I was going to show you some of the others, but I won't. Uh, so uh, I just want to point out that a, a study like this involves really big teams. Uh, so we have uh, engineers uh, who develop a lot of the sensors and do a lot of the initial processing of the sensor streams. These are, this then gives the behavioral scientists features or contextual variables that we might be interested in, whether or not they in, impact the effect of our intervention or not. Uh, behavioral scientists uh, are intimately involved in this, of course. Human computer interaction people, these are people that study how the computer uh, what, how you present information on the mobile device or on a wearable so that it's most uh, conducive to, uh, to the person responding to that. Uh, this is a really important area. Uh, lots of people who develop the apps, um, statisticians, more behavioral scientists and so on. Everyone has to come together to uh, run these kinds of uh, studies. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.